Uh, hello all, good morning. My name is Patricia Falcao and I'm a time-based media conservator at the Tate. I've been there for eight years now. And I'd like to, I just want to start by thanking the Phi Center and the MIT Doc Labs for, uh, MIT Doc Labs, and the British Council for bringing me here. It's quite an exciting conference for me, and you will see. I'd also, I'm not sure Zachary is going to hear that, but I think he just made my presentation for me because I represent the museum that collects, <laughs> and you sh shall see that in a moment. So I'll show you some of the artworks in the collection, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we care for them and what we think is important in their preservation, and then also a little bit of where our challenges lie. My role specifically is mostly about what we do when we ac acquire an artwork. So as, as we find, okay, this is gonna come into the collection, and what do we need to do with it? So it's quite exciting. I don't only focus on software-based artworks, so time-based media conservation deals with anything from film, to so analog film, analog slide, to performance works. So it's quite broad, and software is not too much. It's not a big part of it. And now let's see if I can handle the buttons. Yes. So um, I work at Tate because this, you know, because I'm part of this mission. And I think the key point is when Tate acquires a work, then it has responsibility for keeping it for the long term. We used to say it's forever. I'm a bit sus suspicious about the forever bit, but um, yes. And the other point is that these are works of art, so they're mostly unique and mostly high value. The software-based artworks are obviously contemporary and technology dependent, unlike most of the rest of the collection. Um, and the third point is that they must be displayable in the galleries. So one of the key aspects of preserving them is being able to show them again, which could be defined as access as well. Um, so I'll just show you a little diagram representing the whole collection. So you can see the big blue, dark blue is Turner, so that's drawings and paintings. <laughs> <laughs> the lighter one is all the rest of the art. The yellow bit is mostly video. <laughs> And then the 0.01 is software-based artworks. We are quite fortunate, though, that actually, given how small the, the collection is, well, the software-based artwork collection is, we, we get, it's acknowledged how difficult they are to, to well, or how, how much we still need to learn about them. I don't like to say that they're difficult, because they're not necessarily difficult. We just need to find the solutions. Um, so this is the software-based art collection. I managed to forget one, the last one. I didn't put it on this list. It's not a very long list. It's also, it's been bought, you know, from 2003 until the last one was acquired 2016. It's been sort of once a, one a year, which is a good rate if we want to handle the problems. So I, I see the urgency for lots of other works that are not in the collection, but for me this means I was, I'm given the time to look at them carefully and think about the solutions. Uh, I think the other point to make here is, the, well, there's only two works that have anything online. And one is Brutalismo, that uses Google to search the web. And the other one is Aji, which is a, a, a game running in Flash, currently supported at the email platform. <laughs> so yes, we'll need to do some work there soon. We acknowledge the complexity of the works, and we do know that we have a lot of work to do just to understand how to preserve them. We, also are, we are also very aware that this rate of acquisitions is going to change fairly soon. So I'm sure if I come back in five years' time, this is probably not going to look like that because you know, museums are catching on with the, the world. <laughs> um, uh, the other point is, because we acknowledge this need, we were also given the opportunity to engage with other people. So we've done research or we've worked with the University of Freiburg and Klaus Reschert and Dragon Espensheet, for instance, in testing emulation for our own case, because we do have a lot of problems with hardware dependencies, which if you have something online is a little bit less of an issue. Uh, but we're also part of a network of other museums that are doing work and are, are interested in these people. Uh, so for instance, Joanna Phillips at the Guggenheim is doing excellent work in this field. They just got a grant for that. Uh, MoMA with Ben Finoradin and um, Kate Lewis, they've done quite a lot of work on that field as well, SF MoMA, so th this is sort of, and there's also lots of European institutions that are interested in, in the Netherlands and, um, well, 
overall. So I think it's a, a question of time until things come to a better position. So what are we preserving? For me, when I think we're going to get a new software-based artwork, it's usually a computer, and it comes all ready to go in the gallery. That's where they're coming from. So it's usually, you know, we'll get a Mac Mini with the software pre-installed, maybe some of the peripherals ready to go, and then the instru instructions on how to put them in the gallery. I still think of this as the original. <laughs> which I know for anybody working with digital it sounds ridiculous, but it's still the computer that the artist prepared for running in the gallery. This was something we know he was happy with. And I know it's not very a digital position to have, but it still feels like that. And I'm sort of still thinking, like recently we had a curator visiting our stores and they got super excited because we had laser discs from Bill Viola's video works. I mean, Bill Viola has gone off the laser discs in the 90s, but it's like, oh, this is how this work was shown in 1998 or whatever. So it's like, I'm pretty sure, give it 20 years, and if there is a computer that is still running that was supplied by the artist, there will be some curators very happy somewhere. So that's, I still see that as part of my role. Um, but on the other hand, that is not the key aspect of that work, whichever work it is, or in most cases because you do want to be showing the work. And for most artists and for the artists in, in, the, in our collection, they're more interested in the effects and the functions of that work and how people interact with them rather than on the technology behind it. So we do balance those two aspects. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of some works in the collection. So this is the earliest one. It's Michael Craig Martin, who's a British artist who's mostly known for his drawings. And this was his first work done with, with a, a, a live, live um, effect. So he worked with a programmer to just make uh, images appear and disappear randomly on the screen. The composition is fixed, but the changes happen like this. Like I said, he's, uh, he works with graphic art and uh, painting. So for him, it's important that the, the work is shown as if it was a painting. And so we have this really strong connection to the screen and to the aspect ratio of the screen. And I would be perfectly happy to change the computer behind it to swap to a new aspect ratio, but I know we're going to run into problems there. And I'm, that was the one thing he said, well, you don't, you, I mean, we wouldn't want to do it anyway. You can change the screen and the aspect ratio of the screen without talking to me because it will just look different. That is where he drew the line. So that was this key aspect that he was interested in. Uh, the second work is subtitled Public by Raphael Lozano Hammer. And what happens is you go into the space and you're tracked by a piece of software that projects verbs on you. So it consists of Mac minis on a network, an internal network, and then video cameras that uh, map the space, a tracking software that finds where you are, and then the words are projected via projectors. He was really happy for, I mean, he was planning to migrate it now. I'm not sure if he started doing that. But again, when we were talking about the work with Conroy Badger back in 2008, I think we installed the work in, in Liverpool, and he was really proud of, of this tracking software because he, Conroy Badger is Raphael's assistant, sorry. And he was really proud of this because at the, in 2005, when the work was produced, this was quite a piece of software. It was an achievement to be able to do that, and it runs. So it, again, it's great that we can show the work. And nowadays, you can do this probably, I mean, I know you can do this much e in a much easier form. But you, you need to acknowledge that by doing that, you may be losing all this technical history behind it. So what we thought this one solution would be is actually emulation is a great opportunity here because it does mean you are still running a, your original software on this fake environment, well, not fake, simulated environment, but you still have that software running. And so we worked with Dragon and Klaus to emulate it. Uh, we were expecting to have a lot of trouble with the peripherals, but actually it turned out that USB, can, you can emulate it easily. Uh, so it just worked, which is good. <laughs> uh, 
there's still some testing to be done because it's hard to compare things if they are as complex as that. Uh, the third example is Ambiente de Estereo Realidad 3, Brutalismo by Jose Carlos Martinat. And what you see, you know, there's this sculptural element, which is a model of the, the army headquarters in Peru called Pentagonito. And then there's a little computer on the right at the bottom and some printers. So the computer is constantly searching the internet, uh, sorry, searching Google for terms related to uh, brutalismo, architecture, violence, dictatorship, and then selects sentences out of the searches and prints them out on those little printers on the top. There's three of them, and they just fall on the floor. And then people are um, welcome to take them home. The interesting bit about this is, of course, it uses Google, so we've already had to change the API the last time we tried to show it. But then what we also found was that once we ran it in London, while, while we were testing it in London, actually, um, the results started showing up about Portuguese dictatorship and British architecture, brutalist buildings in London. And I sort of looked at that and was like, hmm, I wonder how much of an influence my own searches are having on the results that are being printed out because, <laughs> and yeah, well, I, I'm Portuguese originally, so there, there's something there. Um, <laughs> Jose Carlos did find a solution, and I think it's a common solution among artists is if you have something that relying on the web, then you might have a, a little a, a, a database within your system that is saving those searches. So when the internet goes down, you can still run it which is great for us because it means we have a snapshot of the work as it was run in Brazil, and we, can have, a, and we have a snapshot of it as it was run in London uh, three years later, more or less. Uh, but there is a question here, is how much of this evolution is it wanted, and how much of it is, um, or do you want to keep it as an image of what it was at a certain point? I actually think that Jose Carlos would prefer to have it running and get different results later in time, but it depends, I guess, on how much the context changes here as well. So, and I'm going to use a word that, and then I re regretted it a little bit. Significant properties is something that is, is a term that is used in digital preservation. I found out later, after I had adopted it myself, that it's uh, more controversial than I thought it would be. What it means is these are characteristics of digital objects that must be preserved over time in order to ensure the continued accessibility, usability, and meaning of the objects, and their capacity to be accepted as evidence of what they purport to record. And this was, I think this was defined for digital objects specifically. I just find this idea of selecting or of identifying properties that are relevant is really useful for artworks and making them connected to the artwork rather than the, ob the digital object itself, just because it helps us think about what is it from this work that we need to preserve. So I'll just tell you a little bit about how we identify these properties and then what, how that translates into processes. So in this image you can see it's Michael Craig Martin and Pip Lawrenson who was our head a few years back and Daniel Jackson, who's um, the programmer who works with Michael Craig Martin. And this is one of uh, Craig Martin's pieces called Things Change. This happened in the context of a migration. So the work was initially um, made in Director. And then we thought, well, let's see what happens if we move it to Flash. <laughs> uh, this was just before it started declining. So we should have seen it coming, but we didn't. Um, so we just sat there and looked at the screens and compared the two versions and we timed it and made sure that uh, Michael was happy that we understood what Daniel was making. So in these sorts of discussions, and they always happen when we acquire a new work, we, we will always define the display parameters. And this means, for instance, identifying how big a gallery must be or how do you set it up. For something like subtitle public, you need to have a way of uh, hanging the projectors and a certain size and the, with the color of the space, for instance. Uh, we then discuss it so about, we discuss what can or cannot be changed in a work. I found over time that actually if you just push it to the limit, you kind of, sometimes you think it's the limit and then you kind of go like, oh no, actually that's fine. And it, it sort of go, well, what if we changed all those colors? And of course the, the reaction is no, we need to keep the colors as they are. Or, uh, <laughs> 
you know, but it's finding those boundaries and, and where can we, what can we change and what can we not change. And sometimes some, something that I didn't think was important, for instance, for Brutalismo, you have the small black computer on the floor that I assumed, okay, this is just something that he had on the back of his car when he was producing the work and we can replace it by something else. Maybe he wants something that came out of the late 90s or early 2000s or something, but it's not very relevant. And then when I asked him, he was like, well, no, actually, can you please keep that one if you can, which is, and it, because it's visible on the floor that is relevant. So asking is good. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you do not want to know. You know, you need to know what's going to become obsolete faster, or, or at least try to guess that. And also, what is more likely to break? And then just think, okay, what can I do to to reduce these problems or mitigate them? And then the other point is that some artists actually have very clear ideas of how their work must be preserved, and we're very happy to work with them on that and understanding those. Points. And for doing that, we use we have these four four strategies. And I'm going to just start at the bottom with storage. Yes, we do keep our hardware in controlled environmental conditions, just as we do with our sculptures and our paintings. We know they're going to die, and the next time we try to show them, we might just it's not going to work. But we do want to try and keep them for as long as possible. I started thinking of migration and emulation separately because that's how we face them first. But actually, I think in the end, we'll probably be using both in parallel. And the decision to use one of the other is down to the technology you have. And in some cases, it's sort of, you know, migrating, it's, it's probably faster and simpler. If you have 10 lines of code on something, then it's a lot less hassle than, than doing it you know, a whole emulation for, for something. It will be different for each artwork, basically. That's what I'm saying. Oh, the other point about storage is we do, we do plan, we, we do have um, archival digital storage. So we are keeping all the digital assets we have in, um, also in controlled conditions. <laughs> and the th but the, the overarching th theme there is actually this documentation. If you know any conservator, if you ever worked with one, you probably know that we are a little bit fixated on documentation. That's what we are trained to do, and that's what we spend half our lives doing. And I always think, well, at some point, it might be just too much. And then one day, I was having this conversation with Jill Sterrett, at uh, head of collections at SFMOMA. And she described the role of a conservator as creating finds, as in archaeological finds. So, we are creating finds for future conservators or curators. We are giving other people the opportunity to understand the works that we have now. You know, and you're really happy if you have a whole object that is perfect and shiny. I don't know if you get many of those if you're an archaeologist, but, but you're also just as happy to find the remains of you know, something encased in mud. So we're doing a lot, I think. I think the other aspect that is important here is the installation specifications, for instance, and, and the, the function of the work in, in the technical specifications, in the sense that many of these installed works, they are very complex to install. And they mean you, you need to set the software properly, you need to calibrate it, and we need to be able to do that independently from the artist. You know, we are very happy to work with them for as long as we can, but we, we are planning for the long term, so we do need to have that authorship, or not authorship, sorry, the ownership. And so I guess the other point is, so we do keep other stuff besides documentation. And this is actually the work that was done, well, it's the result of a few stages. Uh, the most recent was this creating these disk images of the original computer and the disk image built from scratch, which is the result of the collaboration with, uh, with, the Freiburg, with Freiburg University, with whom we developed a workflow to address our issues. I think that's usually the first, or that's, this will be our next first step when we acquire something, is just to make a copy of, of that hard drive that we receive. And this is really, you know, it's really interesting because it's sort of the next best, best thing to having your artist's computer. We also create a backup, so we'll have an exact, a similar computer running the, the, the same software 
that will be used for exhibition purposes so that we spare the other one, the original one. Um, and then we also started keeping copies of operating systems, executables li and libraries and that sort of thing. And by creating that disk image built from scratch and the backup hardware computer, that's when we find what we may be missing w once we try to install it later. Uh, and now, so the final point is whenever we do these sort of treatments, we do spend a lot of time evaluating the results and making sure that they look right. So in this case, this is a work by uh, John Gerard, South Farm, and it's a 3D simulation. And it runs on a very, well, in a gaming computer with a very powerful mm -hmm. graphics card. So we thought, we didn't think we would be able to run, in, run it on a virtualizing platform. But actually, again, the first time we tested it, it didn't run, and then there was an update a few months later, and it started running again, which I thought was a pro positive development. Uh, but when we tried it, so John is very careful about how his work is presented. It's meant to be very large in the gallery. You saw the picture in the room. And the quality of the image is very important, so we do spend a lot of time tweaking settings to make sure things look right. And they also must run really smoothly and at this rate. So I'll just finish here, and I hope you got a glimpse of what we do and our worries are.